I think. So, hello. Welcome to the show. What's going on? This is the Other People Program. I am Brad Listy, and I'm here in Los Angeles. Thanks for listening. Today on the program, my guest is author and screenwriter David Kapp. First, you have to talk about the experience of being 14 to 24 years old. Because, in my opinion, that is when all the creative neural pathways are formed. And the things you watch, the things you listen to, the things you read in that period will affect you and form you more profoundly, I think, than anything else for the rest of your life. That was David Kapp, author of the new novel Aurora, available now from Harper Books. Aurora is the official July pick of the Nervous Breakdown Book Club. TheNervousBreakdown.com is my online culture magazine and literary community founded many years ago, almost 20 years ago. It has its own monthly book club. The way it works is you sign up, you get a new book delivered to your door every 30 days. I interview book club authors on this podcast. So you can read and then listen, or listen and then read. It's a nice uh, holistic experience. For more information on the book club, go to the Nervous Breakdown. Dot com. So David Kep is a double threat. Author of two novels, his first entitled Cold Storage was published in 2019, and now he's got this new one out from Harper. It is called Aurora, and it is earning rave reviews. It's a literary thriller. Perfect for the summer season. David Kep also happens to be one of the most accomplished screenwriters of his generation. He has written or co-written screenplays for a number of films that I think you could fairly say exist in the pop culture pantheon. These films include Carlito's Way, Jurassic Park, Mission Impossible, Panic Room, Spider-Man, War of the Worlds, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and then this year, Uh, He wrote a film that came out directed by Steven Soderbergh. It's called Kimmy, starring Zoe Kravitz. It it, uh, premiered on HBO Max not too long ago. So um, a writer who has experienced incredible success both as a literary writer and as a writer for the screen. And it's exciting to get a chance to talk to somebody like that on this program, to get to know a little bit about who he is and where he's from, and also how he works in both modes. So without any further ado, let's get to today's conversation. Here I am with David Kep, and his new novel, One More Time, is called Aurora. Uh, the Carrington event was a solar phenomenon that happened in 1859. It was an enormous solar flare, which expelled uh, what's known as a, a, a CME, a coronal mass ejection. And the sun has these all the time, two or three a day in the period of maximum solar activity. And it's just a giant, the flare spits out this giant cloud of electromagnetic plasma, which normally drifts off into space and is never heard from again because space is large. However, occasionally they head toward Earth if our orbit is just right. And they normally make sort of a glancing blow, if at all. When they touch the Earth's atmosphere in any way, they really re- the, the CME really wreaks havoc with the magnetosphere, and it injects an enormous amount of electromagnetic energy into the Earth's magnetosphere. It happened, the last time that happened at all was uh, 1989 and caused the Quebec blackout of 1989, because our power systems are in no way set up to withstand that amount of energy uh, coming from the sun. The Carrington event in 1859 was a direct hit on Earth. It, it was, there, was, there were zero degrees of inflection. This massive CME came toward Earth and hit us directly. And what it did was kind of, just kind of fascinating at the time. It was named after this British astronomer, uh, Richard Carrington, who observed it. It hit the Earth's magnetosphere, the skies lit up in a really spectacular auroral display all over the world. So picture the northern lights, but far brighter and all over the world. 
the night skies were lit up as daytime. Everyone could see it except for a band around the equator. And the, the only, but the only electrical system that was up and running at the time was the telegraph system. And that was sh completely shut down for days and major repairs were required. Telegraph operators reported fire bursting out of their signal boards. The, the platinum relays melted. It was quite a spectacular event. But it was only telegraph, and it was only three days. Clearly, things have changed since 1859. And the entire world is now on a series of interconnected electrical grids, except for some very remote locations. Anything that's plugged in, if we were to suffer a direct hit from a major CME again, which we will, they happen every couple hundred years. If, if it were to happen again, electrical systems over the entire world would be shut down and repair estimates run from 12 to 18 months, depending on the government report you read. So I know a premise when I hear one. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, th like this is something I got to be, I got to confess to you. I hadn't even heard of this. I'd never heard of the Carrington event and then began to read and got curious and started to kind of browse around on the internet to see how real this is. This is deadly serious. This could happen. It will happen. It's a, it's a, it's just a, you know, it's a, the, when the odds catch up with us. And I'm not saying it'll happen in our lifetime. If you look at the historical record and you have to interpret the historical record to, because they didn't have a name for something like this. So it tended to be expressed in poetic terms. There's a, in the book of Ezekiel in the Bible, there is an event described that sounds like it would have been a CME hitting the Earth's atmosphere. It was interpreted as, you know, the heavens opening and a host of heavenly angels appearing in, in some greater detail. But they, they happen every couple hundred years. And so it will happen, It's in, and, but it's very, very hard to prepare for the next crisis. We tend to prepare very well for the last crisis. I think the next time there's a global pandemic, we might be better prepared and know what to do. But it's, it's, it's hard to sort of game it out and spend some money hardening our infrastructure to get ready for something like this, which seems so science fiction-y. Right, right. And also, like, so un like, I mean, it's predictable within a, a a couple century range, but it's not pre it's not predictable with specificity, so people can kind of pretend it's not going to happen. It's not the sort of thing you can get reelected on, right? <laughs> you know? Right, right. So, it, you know, this novel explores powerlessness in a literal sense. You know, the entire planet essentially, or most of the planet, loses power and goes into a blackout, which wreaks havoc on uh, civil society, uh, to say the least, and. The way in for you, which I find interesting and also kind of logical, is to kind of take this big, huge planetary event slash catastrophe, but then to explore it in the, in the micro, to take it into one town, one family, and to kind of investigate the effects that it has there rather than to try to you know, tell the story on some kind of global canvas, which would be giving yourself a huge and maybe impossible task. Yeah, it, it's, I, I took a page from, there was a, I, I wrote a, a version of The War of the Worlds in uh, 2005 that Spielberg directed. And I remember early on in talking about it, we actually sat down and made a list of, because obviously there've been a lot of a lot of alien invasion movies. So we, we sat down and made a list of all the things we did not want to see in our movie. Uh, and we, you know, said, uh, the White House, the President of the United States, uh, global landmarks being destroyed, generals with maps pushing things around and, you know, having arguments. And so we came up with this idea that we would tell it from one character's point of view as literally as possible. So if uh, the rule was, if... Tom Cruise's character didn't see it, we don't see it. And if we need a great big global view of something, Tom Cruise needs to climb a hill so he can look down at a great big global view and we can, we can show what's going on. And we actually found that very liberating, and I wanted to do it here again, because the world is too big, as, as, as you say. And we wanted to narrow our focus, and within that, you know, there's a lot of room for creativity. So I wanted to tell this story in actually two points of view, a brother and a sister uh, in two communities, 
one of which is completely prepared for this. The brother is quite wealthy and is, you know, a disaster scenarist, and he's he's got himself a bunker and seemingly everything planned and under control. And his sister, who lives in Aurora, Illinois, um, her, it, it has a life that's a bit of a mess. Uh, she's completely unprepared for tomorrow, much less, you know, some kind of global catastrophe. And then I wanted to see if those if their paths could cross, if the guy who thought he had it under control watched it fall apart and the woman who was not at all ready uh, discovered some inner strength. So uh, that, that was my that was my big idea. OK. And so a natural question, I think, to ask you is that having explored all of this stuff and written an entire novel about it and also written and directed a movie that explores this theme of powerlessness all the way back in 1996, I believe, The Trigger Effect. Yes. Exactly. So this isn't your first go round with the idea of a blackout uh, or a loss of power, both literal and figurative. I'm wondering how deep into prepping you are. Like, do you have uh, like a a store of canned goods in your in your uh, basement or anything like that? You would think, wouldn't you? Yeah. And I I don't even have any extra batteries. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I couldn't handle if my TV remote went down. I, w- I would be at a loss. I would have no idea what to do. You'd think because I, it, it was, it was great fun to research. There's a lot of literature out there about it, and a lot of people are very into prepping. And so I, I found there are a lot of podcasts of uh, you know prepping enthusiasts, uh, and I loved that because I could listen to how they express themselves and what they're you know, feelings are and, and, and not just the dry stuff that you might read in the book. And through all that and writing the script, which or I mean, the novel, which takes months and months, and then you rewrite it and you research it and you send it to people to vet it for accuracy. And you, there's this enormous immersion in the topic. And you would think some of that would have rubbed off on me. But I think it goes to personality type. And I'm just not, some of us kind of get into prepping for stuff like that and knowing that we're ready. And being okay with the idea that this might happen, something unexpected might happen, and some of us stick our head in the prefer to stick our head in the sand and and hope that it won't. And I'm afraid I'm the second one. Yeah, I mean, I think I I have a go bag. I live in Los Angeles, so it's like earthquake stuff. And I think when the the Houston hurricane hit a few years ago, and there was all that flooding and and disaster and human suffering, I got. You know, I got the itch or I decided to try to at least get a go bag packed. I don't have food storage, but I do have like a backpack that we're supposed to grab if we ever need to get out of Dodge. And so I think do you have a place to go once you get out of Dodge <laughs> or will you get on the or will you get on the one on one with everybody else? Yeah, yeah. I mean, see, this is the this is the question I want to ask you purely out of self-interest is that having done all of this research as somebody who lives dead smack in the center of Los Angeles this doesn't seem like a good place to be in the event of one of these mass blackout events. It seems like a place that would be ripe for chaos. Would your advice to me, your professional advice would be to get the heck out of here? Um, no, my advice would be to shelter in place, uh, because there's a lot of people are going to get the heck out. Right. And they have some place to go and that's great. A lot of people are going to try to get the heck out and realize wait, where are we going? I mean, they will have thought, well, we'll go to my cousin in, in Denver. Denver's in the same boat. So you're, you're be- you know your, know your environment, and you know your home, you know your neighborhood. I, I think in, and if we're talking specifically about this, but really any disaster, everything that's local becomes much more important. Your, I'm sure, were you in that house during the pandemic? Yeah. I'm sure you got to know your neighbors in a way you didn't before. And I know I did. And that was really meaningful to me. And community is really important. You'll figure out how to get food and water, but you'll have as good a chance doing it there as you will anywhere else. As far as, you know, is, is social, mass social unrest going to become a problem? In some places, Los Angeles is a bit spread out. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people there, but... Not everybody's going to go nuts and be awful. I wouldn't want to be in maybe Times Square. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be in a place that it's very hard to get resources. But I think you. I think you're actually in in okay shape. Water might be an issue. 
you might consider a bunch of arrowhead jugs in your basement. I already have those. I do have lots of, go. I have some You're arrowhead jugs. I'm ready. You're way ahead of everybody I'm else. trying, I'm trying. So you did write this book while living through the pandemic, correct? Yes. And it has, I mean, you, you just kind of touched on it, but it has to have infected the writing. I think it totally changed it. I mean, there's no way of knowing what it would have been before. I, I had come up with the idea, the general idea and rough outline of the book before, before COVID. And as COVID started and we all went into lockdown and I was getting ready to start the book, I called my editor and said, is this still, it feels like it's, it's different. It's got to be different, you know, and we decided there's two ways to go. You either, and this, you see this in movies now and really all, you know, all art. The creator of the art, Eve, decides either this movie, play, book, whatever, exists in a world where there's been COVID or it doesn't. It exists in a world where there hasn't. And if it exists in a world where there's been COVID, it must be acknowledged. It's like World War II. You wouldn't write something said in 1948 and not have somebody be a veteran or have lost someone in the war. Or It was, it was a signal event of the last 20 years. So I felt it was something to be acknowledged. There wasn't much that it would change in the plot. I'd say it changed the tone, perhaps, because the characters are a bit weary. And I think we all are. And I thought the most, you're right, I only specifically mentioned COVID a few times, but for me, it was in the characters' minds all the time. And I think the most salient thing any character said about it is there's a 15-year-old kid in it. And he says at the beginning, when he and his stepmom are going to the grocery store, you know, in the lead up to this to get whatever they can off the shelves. He says, he just doesn't want to get out of the car. And he says, I can't go through this again. And in short, she says, but you are. So grab a bag. Right. <laughs> and I thought that was, that was about all that had to be said. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, the weariness, I cannot imagine having to go through something else. I mean, I think when recently there was this news of monkeypox making its way around the world i detect Which is a very a very uh, show busy name but right. monkeypox <laughs> is, is fabulous it's, you yeah. might want to take that and run with it but i i yeah. you know i uh i detected like on social media the earliest inklings of weariness like i just can't it was what basically was the common sentiment like we can't do this again there can't be another one right and so i don't want to consider it i mean that's i see now there's a slow vaccine rollout for monkeypox I don't want to get that. Right. I know I should. If I should, I will. Right. But I don't, I don't, I don't want to go do that. I don't want to just go get vaccines now. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only reason to leave the house, David. Is yeah. Just go, go, go get another injection. So I wanted, I, we talked about it a bit, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, the, the trigger effect in 1996, this movie about a blackout in Southern California. I believe that's yes. correct. And yeah, it's never named, but yes, it's Southern California. Okay. So... I'm I'm interested to hear you talk about how that creative experience might have informed this one. Like, what did you learn from that one that might have helped you on this one? What did you take with you? What did you leave behind? Like, how, do you see them as like super related, or or do you see them as more distinct? Yeah, no, I see it. Uh, there's a there's a there's a string of influences there. I think in a lot of the original stuff I've worked on my whole career, I'm I'm still tr trying to tell the monsters are due on maple street i don't know if you remember that twilight zone episode it, it, it's an episode uh, set on a block like yours and mine when power goes out unexpectedly no one can explain it and they kind of freak out on each other and start behaving badly uh and then the twilight zone kicker at the end is aliens have done it uh, as an experiment to see how easily they can throw human society into chaos prior to an invasion and i just look it, it's one of the greatest Twilight Zones. My uncle was an actor who was in that episode, so I always felt a special connection to it. Claude Akins. Oh. Uh, some people may remember the great character actor, Claude Akins. And I just loved that episode because it was about all the things I like to tell stories about, which are people I might identify with or relate to, and something extraordinary happening to them, and how do they handle it. So in the movie I made in 96, which was the first movie I directed, excuse my voice, was, um, it was called The Trigger Effect, and it was a three-day blackout. It was very narrow in its focus. Even then, I knew enough not to get too big. It was about three people, a married couple and their friend, 
it was over about three days. And it told there's the, the blackouts never explained. You don't see what's going on in the rest of the world. They freak out and don't behave terribly well. But at the time, and, and I like it, it, it turned out pretty well, I thought. At the time, however, I remember thinking, boy, I wish I could stretch this to 185 days and see what that would be like. Uh, and I wish I could know at least what was going on in the world. And I love a concrete reason why this happened. It was too late to do any of that. The movie was done, but I kind of kept that in the back of my mind for a while. Sometimes I think these things have to percolate, even for a, a really long time, you know, over a period of many years. And a related question has to do with research. You know, I think a lot of people listening who might be writers themselves might be thinking about like how to land on an idea like this. I suppose some of it is serendipity. Some of it is following your nose and the things that are interesting to you and reading about these things. And then uh, at a creative level, getting into the project and learning how to draw a line for yourself when it comes to research, because I think sometimes we can get bogged mm. down in research as a matter of convenience. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to just keep researching. Uh, oh, it's a great dodge. Yeah, it's a great yeah. dodge. So I'm just curious to hear, you know, about landing on this idea, which I think in Hollywood parlance would be called a high concept idea, settling on it, recognizing it as a good idea, and then doing a necessary amount of research, but maybe not too much research before you get into the actual, to the actual drafting. Yeah. Well, the idea, the idea thing can come from anywhere. Obviously, it was an idea that had been in my head for a long time. And I can't remember when I decided to tie it to a CME. It was at some point in the 30 years between 96 and now, 25. But I, you know, ideas come from all over the place. I did a movie, I had a movie uh, earlier this year on HBO Max called Kimmy that uh, Steven Soderbergh directed. And the idea for that one came from an article I read in The Guardian, I think about you know people who listen to uh, Siri or Alexa type devices listen to the recordings they made to try to correct them when when the device misinterpreted the person and I thought ooh wait there's a listening device in our home and somebody's listening to it and your mind spins from there so to get very pedantic about it when I I have um, I have an idea file and if I get an idea or read an article or anything comes up I send myself an email park it in story ideas and if it keeps percolating and I have other ideas related, then it busts out into its own file. And if that file gets big enough, I feel I maybe should take a crack at that and see how it goes. So then starts research. And research is great fun. I didn't know about the Carrington event until I Googled coronal mass ejection. And then I saw not only had there been this incredible one 150 years ago, but it has a really cool name. The Carrington event just sounds very, very uh, <laughs> enticing. To me. So, um, so you start reading, and the re the research I do now, pre-internet, it was different. You would have to find people and talk to them and read their books, and you know. Now, of course, you can find almost anything you need online. The danger with that is you don't, you should order a few books and read them because you don't think about it as deeply. You know, you click on this Wikipedia article, which takes you to that one, which takes you to another one, and it's a little scattered. So I gather as much as I can, uh, but I don't want to over-research it because I'm not making a documentary or writing a nonfiction book. I'm trying to make up a good story. So when I feel like I have enough to go on where I kind of know what I'm talking about, I'll start writing. And it's not until I have a first draft that I'll go out and find advisors and say, will you please read this? Have a good laugh at the science, but then tell me how I can fix it. And you did and, this. You did this with cold storage. Uh, your previous yeah. novel uh, regarding the, the what is it? The science of fungus. Yes, uh, fungi and and in general and how how they might transmit how this how this known fungus Ophiocordyceps that a lot of people have heard of that's in the animal world and infects ants primarily and other insects. How might a virus like or a fungus like that make the jump to humans is that ridiculous to think and um, I remember having a I had a great advisor on that a microbiologist who read it and said I took it as a great compliment he read it and said the science isn't terrible <laughs> I said okay and he said and I'll help you out but you must promise one thing Please never ever confuse a benzene 
and a fungus again. They are incredibly different. It's like comparing a, a pair of socks to the Empire State Building. And if you swear you'll, you'll, you'll work hard to get that straight in the book, then I'll help you out. And I said, I absolutely promise it'll never happen again. And we fixed it. So just to review and to clarify, you take your research as far as you can. You kind of intuit when you have enough to go on to begin drafting. You write a first draft, and it's at that point that you begin the vetting process with an expert to try to make sure you have your I's dotted and your T's crossed within, yes. within the confines of you know, fictional narrative storytelling. You do give yourself some latitude. Yeah, and I wait till that first draft because I don't want reality to constrain a good story. And my primary responsibility is to the story and the reader and that it be entertaining. So I, I, that I have to get straight. Then can I bend the story in a, a way that's acceptable to me to, to meet reality? And finding that happy medium is the whole thing. But the closer you are to reality, and I did hew close to reality in both those books, the closer you are, the the reader can feel it. You know that that's more real and therefore the story is more effective. Okay. But just to, to offer maybe a counterpoint, I read that when you were writing Mission Impossible, which I believe was directed by Brian De Palma, the first Mission Impossible, yes. there is the scene where Tom Cruise is dangling by a wire. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he's he cracking a safe. He's trying to get past he's some... breaking into the CIA of all places. Can okay. you imagine? Yeah. To steal the non-official cover list, the, the, true, the list of true identities of espionage agents all over the world. Okay. And so he's dangling from this wire. It's kind of an iconic action movie scene. Most of us are familiar with it, you know, visually. And here is an example of you kind of busting out of the confines of what might be real, quote unquote, realistic, you know, in, in service of story and in service of entertainment. Is that an, a fair appraisal? Like, because I think what you said was that, you know, if you ask the guys who actually work in the CIA how security might work there, it would be a couple of guys or a bunch of guys crammed into a room looking at tiny video monitors, right? Or something like that. It was so boring. Yeah. It was, cr it was criminally dull. You would think being the CIA... They'd have something pretty sexy as, in terms of their defense systems. They do not. I don't doubt that they're effective, but it, boy, would it have made a boring sequence in a movie. Yeah, so we said, okay, we researched, we were, you know, we had a lot of advisors on that movie. And we said, okay, okay, we get it. And then we went home and said, okay, the hell with all that. Let's throw every bit of that out and just make it up. And we tried to make it. As, you know, Brian wanted to do Tom coming down from the ceiling. He wanted that dangling thing. And I said, great. So the floors has to have a bunch of sensors. Why don't we make it like that Michael Jackson video where it's going to light up if he touches it? Uh, oh, no. What if a drop of sweat? Oh, and Brian said, keep ratcheting up the sensors. Maybe there's also a heat sensor and there's a noise sensor. So it's got to be completely quiet. And we just made up a bunch of shit, which, <laughs> you know, because that's a big summer movie. And I think that we I think it, it worked out well. I want to talk about your creative DNA, uh, especially your literary DNA, because I find it interesting. And I think once I knew it, I could trace it a little bit in the novel. Two big writers for you, maybe the two big writers for you, are Stephen King and Kurt Vonnegut, who function as kind of, the, they're like polarities in a way, because Stephen King is this horror writer. He writes popular fiction. Kurt Vonnegut's books are also popular, but I think he falls more into the literary slash sci-fi category. But can you just talk a little bit about their influence on you and how you assess it in terms of how, you know, they, they impact your approach to storytelling? Yeah. Uh, I mean, first you have to talk about the experience of being 14 to 24 years old. Because in my opinion, that is when all the creative neural pathways are formed. And the things you watch, the things you listen to, the things you read in that period will affect you and form you more profoundly, I think, than anything else for the rest of your life. And those were the two big guys I was reading when I was about 16, 17, and up till my early 20s. And I still read King to this day, of course, but that was when I was discovering them because, of course, you also have that great feeling no one ever has. <laughs> right. Um, I, I, picked up a, I picked up the Sirens of Titan at the Walden books when I was about 16 years old because 
he had a cool name and it had a science fiction -y cover. And I was sure that I had discovered this very obscure writer. And I remember telling an English teacher about it a year or two later because I'd read three or four books. And she said, yes, he's, um, yes, people know about him. It's, right. <laughs> it's not just you. Uh, but, you know, Vonnegut had this combination of humanism and an affection for a sci-fi premise. And that got him onto the, into the literature section of the bookstore, as you say. And I don't think anyone had done that before. I guess H.G. Wells. There's a there's a there's a terrific documentary that Robert Wide made about Vonnegut that came out last year. So that was a major influence. And around the same time, I was reading The Stand and The Dead Zone and you know the really seminal King books, which are also full of a lot of heart and have terrific characters, but are you know, page turning machines. You know, he's he's just he's just so so ridiculously gifted at it and so somewhere in between those i i mean that those influences from 14 to 24 go in your head you shake it up a little with a little bit of living and what comes out is you and you said that your i think you said that your favorite movie of all time is rosemary's baby does that square with the the stuff that you're talking about with regard to king and vonnegut i think so because it's both the big premise you know having the devil's baby, it's a pretty big premise. And it's grounded in a very human story. It's about a who can you trust at home. And it's about a marriage and, you know, the husband sells his wife out. I don't mean to give away the ending. So it's it's something fantastic happening in a domestic environment. That's always been that's always been the stuff I'm most drawn to. And in terms of the differences in writing a novel versus writing screenplays where you've had such incredible success do you find I know there are you know there are obviously common threads, but is one harder than the other? What has the experience been like of going from writing feature scripts to writing novels with you know their greater degree of interiority and and kind of uh, you have total control with a novel in ways that you don't when you're scripting? Yeah, the first because I didn't write my first novel until you know I was in my fifties, uh, which I'm I'm still and you know, after 30, 35 years of screenwriting. So the experience, I, I was giddy. First of all, as you point out, there's a greater degree of interiority, which means there's a greater freedom. I, I hadn't realized that for, you know, 25 movies or whatever, I had not been able to write what anyone was thinking. Not even once. I think I had one movie with voiceover. And that's about as close as you can get. And so I, when I started, I... I I, I just couldn't believe how, how, I don't want to say easy, no writing's easy, but it was how unlimited it was, how freeing it was. I could write what someone was thinking and feeling. And that is the difference between a movie and a, a book in terms of writing. Books, books are about, books are written by talking about what people are thinking and feeling. They have action and plot, of course, but movies are only about what characters say and do. And that's a great big difference in screenwriting your tools are what does the audience see what does the audience hear if they don't see it and don't hear it you may not put it in the script uh, it has nothing to do with it you can't write he feels sad you have to write him doing something that gives us the impression he's sad or another character says how's tom he looks sad you know you can do that too so it's a, it's a great big difference in terms of writing screenwriting is really crafty and it's hard and I don't think there are many people who really can do it well because it's just this weird you know it's like you know the good you know the good electrician when you get them and it's just a skill so there's a tremendous amount of art of course but it's a different kind of skill I think writing a book it's of course a skill and a craft but it's it's a it's a whole different animal, and it doesn't it's not as it's not as limiting as screenplay writing is. Yeah, it's a it's a defined form screenplays, and I think a lot of what we're talking about here, we talk about this with Stephen King and his masterful plotting and his ability to write page turners, but that to also render characters of depth that generate empathy and emotional responses in readers, and then Kurt Vonnegut fusing you know a highbrow literary fiction with sci-fi plots and that kind of thing. You know, it's it's I, I call it cross pollination. 
you know, and mm. I have often said that some of the best literary instruction that I've gotten has come from attempts at screenwriting and reading screenwriting books and having to deal with structure and issues related to story structure in a really explicit way, which I think screenwriting enforces on you in ways that, say, a literary novel might not. I could detect in reading Aurora, just I think kind of what has to be by now at your stage, uh, uh, at the, this stage of your career with all the experience you've had in writing successful commercial screenplays and movies, uh, just a, a very careful attention to story structure and plotting and character development. You know, I, I feel like those pieces were there for me as a reader. And I'm interested to know like what might have carried over from a drafting perspective in terms of like how you might outline or prepare or consider like what I guess you would call story beats and screenwriting in the writing of a novel. I know it wasn't a one for one, but can you just talk a little bit about that part of it? Yeah. When I was coming up in the early mid eighties, I was in film school and the dominant screenplay writing textbook was screenplay by uh, Sid Field which is still around to this day and is worth reading. There have been a million of them since, but screenplay was my generation's you know, thing we all read. And what I found helpful about it, now it's an extremely dogmatic book, almost laughably so in spots. He will insist, thus and so must occur on page 17, not page 15, not page 18, 17. Right. And it, you know, it's kind of crazy. But, but what he did was he laid out a theory that stories are, have beginnings, middles, and ends which is what Aristotle was talking about in the poetics and that beginnings tend to be first acts tend to be kind of shorter and establish things quickly. Middles tend to be very long, you know, longer and they've had lots of complications and things change kind of in the middle. And then endings like in life tend to be kind of exciting and brief. That to me was so incredibly helpful because I had something to hang my hat on. And I love a theory when someone presents you with a theory, especially if they say, and this is how it must be, I love it because you can either embrace it or you can completely rebel against it and do something else, but you have somewhere to start. So when it came time to do a novel, I still be believe in the first, second, and third act. Both my books tend to happen in a beginning, middle, endy way. Everybody's, all stories do but it's a little conscious. I want the reader to feel that. So they kind of feel like, don't worry, we're going somewhere. Um, and I looked at the, I outlined in the same way, which is, you know, a little three by five cards, jotting what that chapter might be, or that scene might be I'm laying them all out on a table. And in the case of the book, I just viewed, I just thought I need three times as many cards. Um, and, and I would start now, Having said that, it's different in that screenplays screenplays are structure. That that is the dialogue should be good, the action should be good. If the structure's not there, it, it it's a pointless endeavor if it's not a solid structure. There's there's a lot of talk about all the president's men and Hornaday wrote a piece about it for the Washington Post recently. Who deserves credit? You know, was it all William Goldman? Was it all Robert Redford? How much did who did what? And what I usually when I read other people writing about how screenplays happen, I sort of look down my nose. You don't know what you're talking about till you do it. But there was a somebody said in that article, and I can't remember if it was her or uh, Redford or somebody else said what Bill did that was genius. The movie wouldn't have happened without it. Is he figured out where the story starts, which wasn't that hard. More importantly, he figured out where it ends because it ends in a place we wouldn't expect, which is Nixon's second inauguration. It's not when it all falls apart, it's when it's all going great. He's being inaugurated, and if you remember the end of the movie, while the 21 gun salute is going off at, the, uh, uh, at his inauguration, they're in the newsroom typing up the next story. Not the one that would bring him down, but the next story. So they're working, and then you see a series of teletypes as things fall apart and he ultimately resigns. But Bill figured out where that story should end. And if you don't have that ending, you got five years of history that are very hard to tell. So breaking the structural nut is a huge part of a screenwriter's job. Um, in a novel, 
we're less we're less driven by this must keep moving. We all appreciate a, a novel that moves along well and has a nice sense of pace, but we can also put it down and go to bed and pick it up tomorrow. And because you're ideally gonna gonna digest a movie in one sitting, you don't have that kind of patience. If a movie's, especially now that we watch so many on our couch, if a movie's dragging and can't have a sense of where it's going, we will begin the doom scroll of the death scroll of looking for something else. Right. We'll pick nothing and go to bed instead. But but in a book, you can you can wander off. So though my outline was specific, it was also loose because that's the fun. You want to be able to digress. So just to, to drill down, like a kind of a crafty, nerdy question, you talk about these scene cards, these three by fives, and how you set them out on your table to kind of get an overview of what you're writing. And you said with a novel, you need like three times as many. When you're writing a screenplay, is there a set number because of the more fixed structure of a screenplay, the kind of limited page count that you're working with? Like what's a ballpark of how many scene cards you would have for a script versus how many you have for a novel? Um, Depends, of course, uh, on a script because they run different lengths. Um, But I would say 30 to 40. Um, A novel, you probably need 100. Um, But again... That's to say that is is dumb <laughs> because it's it's uh, putting a hard and fast rule on something that is amorphous. Right. Um, but since you asked, uh, thirty for one, ninety to one hundred for the other, and each one signifies a scene. Pretty much. Sometimes there's a couple because it's a bigger scene, so you'll have three cards in a row because there are parts to the scene and things that you know things that might happen. Okay. So, but, but I, to be clear, the I don't. I'll have a loose. I'll have a loose outline for the whole movie before I start, um, and then I'll refine it as I go because you learn more as you write. You got to leave room to figure out your story as you go. For a novel, I really maybe I'll have the first four or five chapters and not in a general idea of how it might end. But that outline is really evolving as I write. I don't finish that novel outline until the day I finish the last chapter. Hmm. And we've talked about your, you know, your creative or literary DNA uh, vis-a-vis like the work of Stephen King and Kurt Vonnegut. But I also know, and I guess we, we share this in common, that you are from suburban Milwaukee, as am I. Uh, oh, I was, where are you from? I'm from Cedarburg. Ah. So you were west, I, I think, in Pewaukee. Yeah, I was a little further in the sticks. It, I think it qualified as a small town then. It might be considered the suburbs now. Um, home of J- home of JJ Watt is that right? I feel like the Watt. I feel like I know this. Like the they the, are the, the, the Watts uh, were went to Pewaukee High School as did my father. My dad played uh, wide receiver for Pewaukee High School, and in the later years of his life, he liked to say that he and JJ Watt were on the same football team, <laughs> <laughs> which was true. Yeah. Well, I read that your father worked for or ran a billboard company. Yes. And your mother was a family therapist. And when I, when I saw that, and I don't mean to armchair psych this like to death or anything, but I do feel like I love knowing this sort of thing about people because I'm like, wow, David has gone on to have just extraordinary success, unusual success as a Hollywood screenwriter. Where does this guy come from? And of course, you come from the Midwest in a small town, as so many people who have extraordinary success in Hollywood do. And your father works for a billboard company and your mother's a therapist. There's something about that that makes a certain kind of quick sense to me uh, from, your, from the perspective of your creative makeup. Your ability to recognize a great commercial high concept story idea that might, I guess, in a loose way connect to Billboard, but to also be able to render characters that are human and three-dimensional and round and believable and that drive emotion in viewers or readers that feels like the family therapist thread. Have you ever conceived of it this way? I never thought of it that way. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it makes sense to me. I remember my dad, you know, so he had this small billboard company and he took a lot of pride in their layouts and they hand painted their billboards before it all became you know, 3D printed. And there was a lot of craft that he really took pride in. If we were driving down the interstate and he'd see a competitor's billboard, and, and it had, to his mind, too many words. 
he would shudder and say, look at that. It's a mess. How much of that can you digest? And I said, I don't know. They're open 20. Well, look, and now we're past it. And he, he, it drove him crazy. He was like, you have to be clear. You got to you got to show one good image and you get three or four words and that's it. So that that actually kind of makes a lot of sense. My dad knew how to <laughs> knew how to sell a premise. Right. Well, and also be, you know, compress. Yes. Don't blather on. Don't uh, don't don't say things in 20 words that you can say in four. So you talked about your uncle, who was a, a Hollywood character actor. I have to believe that this made the idea of moving to L.A. and going to UCLA as you did and trying to make your way in Hollywood seem like a more doable thing because, you know, not everybody from a small town in the Midwest thinks that that sort of thing is possible, you know? And I'm wondering if you could just talk about how you, how you made it, like looking back, like how did it happen that you were able to go from someplace, I think with pretty limited Hollywood connections might be a fair way to put it, and to work your way into situations where you're working with directors like Steven Spielberg on Jurassic Park or one of the Indiana Jones movies, Brian De Palma, Mission Impossible. I mean, you've, you've written some huge movies. How, like, how, do you, how did that happen? <laughs> well, to, to the first part of what you said, yes. My, knowing my uncle and having him you know, be kind to me and give me the time of day made it seem possible. It didn't seem ludicrous. Uh, you know, he was from a small town in the South, and my father and he had actually had met at uh, Northwestern University, and they they were in a fraternity together, and they one of their fraternity brothers was from a large Irish Catholic family in Chicago, and he said, hey, I have a lot of sisters. You guys should come home with me and, and, and meet them. So they did, and they married two of them. So th- that's how that's how we became related. Well, then years later, I was born. Clearly, but uh, Claude was very nice to me, you know, and and we would visit them in California, and and once or twice he took me to the studio where he was working, and I would sneak off and walk around the studio a lot, and it 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 was all very cool, and it was also yeah, you just need to see someone who you know, even tangentially, to think, well, I'm not a total asshole for wanting to do this. It's not absolutely out of the question. And then, and then I had a series of, I think all, you know, careers are made first by hard work, second by some talent, and third by, by good fortune. You, you have to get lucky, and you have to get lucky in meeting the right people. Not necessarily rich, powerful people, but people who can, who encourage you at the right time, and people who, who give you just give you confidence and, and help you grow and learn and i had a series of those in my 20s martin donovan was a argentine independent filmmaker i met who was incredibly encouraging and informative we wrote a couple things together um you know i had an early agent who was my age and at a similar point in his career nowhere gavin Pallone, who supported and encouraged me and then the big i think the big break was uh, an executive at Universal named Casey Silver who read a spec script I'd written and liked it and asked me to come work on a few things there and from there I met Zemeckis and Spielberg and on and on and on. My my 20s was, I worked my ass off in my 20s and I, I do think I have a certain amount of talent but I also know enough to know that I, I got lucky in meeting some some generous people who were able to help me. How long does it take you to write a feature script generally? From the time I think of it, if it's an original, till the time I write it is about two years. But that's a lot of gestating. Um, Once I have a workable outline and sit down to write it, that's usually about three weeks. Because once I start, I don't, a first draft. Um, Once I start, I don't want to stop. And I don't take days off and I work really long days. Because as any writer knows, getting in the groove is very difficult. And when you're in the groove, for God's sake, don't let yourself fall out. Right. right. But it sounds like you take a long time to write the outline and a, a shorter time to draft the script. It's getting, yeah. the, it's getting the structure nailed, like getting the kind of the blueprint for the blueprint ready. 
And to yeah, and to take it from an idea, what if there's a great big blackout? To the little bits that emerge take a couple of years. You know, then four months later, you think, oh, and what about these siblings? And one's prepared and one isn't. That's now that's kind of a lot, actually. But so that will have been at least a year to have those ideas come together. In the meantime, you're working on other things, which is always the best time to think about it because you're always trying to avoid what you're doing. Um, so it, it's if it's if it's somebody else's thing, like if someone comes and says, we want to make a movie out of this novel or comic book or something. That usually that draft will take me about three months because there's a lot of getting my head into what they're doing and the writing is slower. Originals, the writing comes out a lot faster. So what about what about adapting your own work? Uh, you know, you've taken Cold Storage and Aurora, and I believe you're the screenwriter on those, right? I would imagine you would be. Yes. Uh, you know, there's fidelity to the original material is always loose, you know, in Hollywood. You have to have the creative permission to sort of make it into its own thing, generally speaking. Do you give yourself that kind of permission? Were there things that as you were writing the novel, you recognized might not make it into a, a movie? Yes, for sure. Because especially, there, there are things where I'm I'm... As, as I'm writing it in the novel, I'm thinking, how in God's name would I get this into a movie? I have an, uh, I have an action or sequence in Aurora that in reality probably takes about 90 seconds. Uh, and it's a good 12 pages in the book because I spend a lot of time inside people's heads. They're very anxious leading up to this. And have they prepared themselves properly? And are they? what's going to happen when he goes through that door? And he plans out different scenarios and those don't work out. And there's really no way to do that in a movie. I try in a first draft of the script. I tried writing it just that way, and I realized this isn't a movie climax. This is this is this was a perfectly great novel climax. I need something else. Something else has to happen. So there are there there are things that I think as I'm writing. Oh, I, this would be good in a movie. But I'm really trying not to think about that because it's hard enough to make one thing work. So I'm I'm trying hard to make the book work before before I make the movie work. And Aurora is going to be directed uh, for the screen by Catherine Bigelow. Catherine Bigelow, isn't that great? That's amazing. Um, yeah, she's really great. People probably know her, but Hurt Locker, Zero Dark Thirty, many others. And uh, I sent her the manuscript early on and said, any interest in this? Because uh, we've been looking for something for a few years. And she, yes, she loved it. So we're working on the script now. Awesome. And so another kind of uh, businessy question regarding Hollywood. You know, it's one thing to be a working screenwriter. It's another thing to be a working screenwriter who gets to work with great directors like Catherine Bigelow. Uh, I think a common theme that I hear, maybe in particular from writers whose work has been optioned or whatever, is that nothing ever happens. Like so few things actually get made. The things that you write get made, and they get made well, typically, typically or a lot of them do. Uh, can you talk about how? Like, what what has to, like, who do you have to know to get things made? I, I guess at a certain level of success and with enough track record, it becomes easier. But have you learned anything you, about the machinery of the business that makes things go? You would think it gets easier. It doesn't. I have had a, a lot of things made. I also have quite a stack on the shelf of things that weren't. It's... It's very hard to get something made. As you can imagine, anything that's going to cost between ten and two hundred million dollars is is going to be hard to to pull off. Um, so, it's I do know, and it changes by the way over the decades. What what is needed? What's the thing that's really going to push you over the line? In the nineties, for example, the spec market was very hot. You would write a script, ideally with a big idea behind it, um, and you'd send it out and studios would want it and they would respond to the story. If all goes well, they want it and they'd respond to the story and then they'd find a director and cast and put them on it and, and make the movie. And they were the driving force behind getting the movie made. Things have evolved and it's not really like that anymore. There's a lot of desire for you to come in with everything put together. They would like a script and a director and maybe a star. Uh, so, I feel it's gotten much harder to sell a script. If you can get it to the point where you have a director and a star, sure you can sell it, but that's you've done all the work for them. 
So I feel that writers and producers are being asked to do a lot of work that studios used to do and seem no longer interested in doing. A little bit the traditional studios, certainly not the streamers. And so what does it take? Now it takes the enthusiastic involvement of other people. You know, no writer can get it done on their own. You need, you need, uh, you know, not just involvement, but enthusiastic develop, uh, involvement from a director, a star, or both. So I read somewhere that you don't feel you're great at pitching or you don't love pitching. I, I know some writers, screenwriters really love to be in a room and they can pitch their work. You have said that you don't love that as much, uh, which kind of struck me as interesting. I would assume that somebody as successful as you would be like the greatest pitcher ever. Is that accurate? No, I'm terrible. I'm, I'll start off okay. I think you see, even in this interview, I'll start a sentence, think of something I meant to set it up with, go back to do that, and then try and pick up where I was, and then come back. There's a, there's a lot of jumping around. Right. And, and the people who are really good at pitching don't do that. They, they tell you a story in, a succinct term from begin, in succinct terms from beginning to end in a way that grips you. Those people, and I've met a lot of them and, and been jealous of them, don't always write them very well. I think sometimes somebody who writes well doesn't pitch well and vice versa. Um, the people who tend to really pitch well are producers. My dad, the billboard salesman, probably pitched, would have pitched very well. I was going to say, um, he, the, he, yeah. would have, he would have done it in under 10 minutes and had them, uh, had them all wrapped. <laughs> You're giving them too much. You're giving them too much. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, so it's, 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 not a, it's a particular skill and gift. And... I would, by the time I have something worked out well enough to pitch, I feel like I almost could have the script. And I express myself a lot better in written terms than I do uh, verbally. So I would, uh, and, and as I've gotten older and have the luxury of not having to maybe worry about the next job as much as I used to, I can do it in private and write it and do all the, you know, what I call chewing with my creative mouth open. I can do that in the comfort and safety of my home or office and then send it off and let people read it and most of this i mean is every script you write these days if you write a feature script it typically sells even if it doesn't get made no no, no god damn it really <laughs> yeah well no, this is... it's hard to sell stuff and yeah no not always i'd say half the time i can get something going the other half no another thing that you have said which i found instructive and intelligent is that when you are in like business meetings in Hollywood where you are talking prospectively about a creative project that what you are looking for, a kind of litmus for you, is sincerity, which I respond to because I've done, I have very limited by comparison screenwriting experience, but I have been in a few rooms like that and found it a little bit destabilizing and I think you maybe articulated why for me is that I was having trouble figuring out where the sincerity was like aside from in myself like I was so deeply invested you know and you just kind of want to be talking with people and collaborating with people who have a similar level of sincerity even if they might not share your exact creative intent can you just talk a little bit more about that or correct me if I mischaracterized it no, it's, 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 a, that's, ex, that's it exactly. You have to mean it. It's got to be something, number one, that you want to see. If you are writing something that you think others will want to see, you are doomed to failure. You cannot lead the parade from behind. You have to, creative success is intentional. Commercial success is an accident. And it, if you mean it and think, no, I would love to see this. I think this is a beautiful story. And then you're able to pull it off. Others will respond. Maybe not as many as you want to respond. So you got to be careful. Is this something that I think you can spend a lot of money on or should you spend less? Other people will help you make that choice. But the, that's the, that's the, the biggest, that's the only thing. It's the only thing that matters. And what I, one of the many things I love about Spielberg is, and I've worked with him various periods for the last 30 years now, 
Never once have I seen his sincerity wane. He means it every single time. And that's, that's what keeps it, that's what keeps it real. Honest is thrown around too much and it sounds bullshitty, but you got to be honest with yourself. Do you like it? And you can tell when somebody doesn't or when they're slumming or they think they're slumming. And that happens often with genre. Somebody, whenever somebody tells you they're making a horror film, but it's going to be an elevated horror film, don't watch it. Because <laughs> if you think the genre needs elevating, needs your particular special touch, you're out of your goddamn mind. There have been brilliant horror films for a hundred years now. We don't need your elevation. Leave the genre alone. So when you, you know, you just talked about Spielberg and working with him and his sincerity. I mean, talk about a, a creative giant. I mean, the guy can do just about anything, you know, he, he could do horror. He could do Schindler's List. He could do Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, it's endless. He could do anything. You've also worked with De Palma. There are other, Steven Soderbergh. Are, is there a through line? Are there lessons you've taken from working with these people, Catherine Bigelow, uh, that, you know, the, the things that they've taught you, think like commonalities you see among these great creative minds who are able to produce and make compelling or, you know, stories that really connect. Is there, like, are they all like special snowflakes or are there things that you see in them that, uh, that form a kind of through line? Uh, kind of. I mean, I don't want to hit sincerity again, but that's a big one. But commitment. They are both so focused on the story they're telling and so tireless that they are tiresome. You know you've got a, direct, a good director's attention when your phone won't stop ringing. They just have more and more and more and more ideas. And I also think they're all honest with themselves about the, the binary nature of connecting with an idea. And you either connect or you don't. There's a one or a zero. You, you get a bunch of ideas or you don't get a bunch of ideas. And some people push through the zero and make it anyway. And none of the people that you just mentioned would. Soderbergh says something I always liked, which was there's two answers on an idea, no or hell yes. And there's really no in between. It can't be maybe if we could get so-and-so in it. No, it's hell yes, and I'll make it with whoever I don't care because I want to make that. That's the only that's the only way to go on. And all those directors would only go on under those circumstances. So before I let you go, I want to talk about what's next for you. I mean, we touched upon writing Aurora and collaborating with Catherine Bigelow. I think you're also working on the Green Hornet. So is is that it for right like in the immediate now, or do you have other projects in the pipeline? That is it. I got an idea or two. I have a thing I'm working on with a friend of mine, but th those are the um, those are the commitments I have. Where someone might call me at any time and say, "Aren't you going to turn that in soon?" <laughs> those those are the ones. Those are the only ones I'm working on right now. All right. And is there a book in the works, or is this Aurora it for now? And we'll see what happens next. Uh, there's a book in the works. It the stage that it's at is. Uh, I have four kids, and as every one of them has said to me at one point or another when they have a paper due, it's all done, I just have to type it up. <laughs> <laughs> on that so note... So it's, it's right here. Yeah. You've got to get it down on paper. Well, on that note, David, I, uh, I so appreciate the time. It's really a joy to talk with you, and congratulations on Aurora and all of the successes that you've had over the years. Uh, it's truly remarkable. And I'm glad we got a chance to spotlight this one in the book club. And I wish you well on all that you have going. Thank you, Brad. Uh, that was really a pleasure. And, and may I add, as, a, as an admirer of research, you do yours very well, I, I can tell. Okay, everybody, there we go. That is David Kep, author of the new novel, Aurora, available now from Harper Books. You can find David on the internet at David Kep. Dot com. You can also track him down on Instagram. His handle over there is at DGCAP. Again, the book is called Aurora, available wherever books are sold. It is the official July pick of the Nervous Breakdown Book Club. If you would like to join the Nervous Breakdown Book Club, just go to thenervousbreakdown.com, click on Book Club in the menu bar. 
If you like this program, I hope you will rate it and review it wherever you listen, be it at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, whatever it is. Rate and review the show if you can. It helps other listeners find the show. You can also support the show over at patreon.com slash other PPL pod. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash other PPL pod. This is a listener supported program. The entire archive is made available for free, almost 800 episodes and counting. So I'm counting on listeners who really like the show and listen regularly to support it. You can do that for as little as $1 per month. I've tried to make it as easy as possible, as accommodating as possible to every level of support you could imagine, starting at $1 a month and moving up the scale. As you move up the scale, you can get stuff, a t-shirt, a tote bag, a coffee mug, a sticker, a book club subscription. I will wish you a happy birthday. I will write you a postcard. Patreon.com slash other PPL pod. If you would like to get my new novel, it is available now in trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook editions. The audiobook edition is narrated by yours truly. Again, it's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. For more information on it, you can visit my website, bradlisty.com. The Other People Podcast has its own official app. Did you know that? It too is free. The Other People app is out there. It's a great way to listen. Go get it wherever you get your apps. The entire archive of this podcast is also made available on YouTube. The Other People Podcast has its own YouTube channel. Go search for it by name, Other PPL with Brad Listy, and subscribe to the channel. It's free. Just push the subscribe button. Click on it. Smash it as the kids like to say. It helps the show find new listeners. So I think that does it for this week. I've got, I believe, Isaac Fitzgerald coming up next week. I'm excited to talk with him. He's a uh, literary impresario, a literary citizen of stature who has been working in the community for a long time and I have never talked with him before. So stay tuned for that next week. Thanks for tuning in this week. And I will be back soon.